Hi, this is Kyle Sofikowski, and in this video we're going to be looking at the role of interest groups in their impact concerning the policy making system. And one of the roles that they serve is being a linkage institution as they are going to be connecting people's interests, problems, concerns, and really putting them on the forefront of the policy agenda with the hopes of impacting policy such as laws uh, in one way or another. So here are some very common examples of interest groups, everything from the American Civil Liberties Union to the National Rifle Association, perhaps one of the more well-known ones, but there are numerous interest groups as there are numerous interests that people have in the United States today. But again, if you were going to give it a, a standard definition, it would be an organization that seeks to influence public policy. And this provides multiple access points for people to have their voices heard. And again, the end result, hopefully, if you're a part of that interest group, is to influence the government policy based on your particular interests. And this is a great connection with Federalist 10 dealing with factions and pluralism in the sense that every faction should be competing more or less equally with one another and not, not one is really dominating over another. The whole idea here is that it's going to prevent the tyranny of the majority. It is important too to differentiate interest groups from parties. Political parties are party generalists, whereas interest groups are party specific, or, or I'm sorry, issue specific, I should say, uh, where they focus on one issue, whereas the political party is going to be focusing on numerous issues. Political parties, they fight election battles, whereas interest groups, they do not field candidates, but they certainly are going to choose sides when it comes to many issues. And as again, I have here that interest groups are policy specialists, whereas political parties are policy generalists. Now, the different types that you have here are, are various. Um, you have single interests where they're focused on one specific issue. For example, if you're the NRA, you're going to be looking at restricting uh, gun control. Uh, so you would be looking for more pro-gun measures and fighting anti-gun uh, measures uh, in all 50 states and also at the national level. Then you have ideological or social movements, the Tax Enough Already Party, any environmental issue or women's rights issue uh, tends to be in that category. And then you have your protest movements, such as the anti-Vietnam uh, is a good example. And here, again, going just back to the Tea Party, here you see the Tea Party as a, a good example of, in a way, an ideological type of interest group as they were focused significantly on taxation as their number one issue. Some do classify them, though, as a third party, um, so it really depends on how closely you're going to be looking at that definition. But ultimately, what makes an interest group successful? Well, their intensity. Uh, single issue groups that focus on a specific narrow interest that don't like compromise often are going to be drawing membership from a good range of people. Uh, gun control actually is the number one single issue group today. Uh, back in the day, it was the anti-Vietnam. Um, and again, groups that are going to be focusing on emotional issues um, are going to, again, increase intensity, especially when it comes to issues such as abortion. You're going to see intensity on both sides of the aisle. And with greater intensity, is going to encourage non-conventional means of participation. When we talk about non-conventional, we're talking about things such as protests. When we're talking about conventional pro participation, we're talking about things like voting or writing to your congressperson. But if you look at the top 25 interest groups in terms of success, and this is going back about five or 10 years ago, but no surprise here, the NRA has been one of the more successful ones. Um, I'd be curious as to where they rank after a number of mass shootings and more media attention towards that, but it would not surprise me if they are still very much up in the top five. Um, AARP for older people, um, and you see some that you may not even really have thought, um, such as the American Medical Association with doctors or with teachers at the national level. But um, again, big thing here with intensity and emotions on, on both sides of the aisle. So with interest groups, again, you have various um, offshoots here, aside from the three general ones. So you have everything from labor, business, social, civil rights, environmental, consumer, narrow, single interest groups. So you have a wide variety uh, in terms of that. The big one I would certainly be familiar with would be the NAACP. We'll certainly focus on, on that in Unit 3. Um, I would also be very much concerned with the Sierra Club in promoting the environment. The NRA, of course, being big, the ACLU and the AARP 
certainly also very important um, interest groups that you should definitely be aware of. Now, in terms of the functions that interest groups play, they are many. They sometimes draft legislation, and they will actually give them to the congressperson. I mean, literally, will give them. They'll write out the bill. They certainly are going to mobilize members, especially when there might be an important vote on legislation. They're going to supply information to voters and politicians. They're going to raise public support and pressure, especially through the media. They're going to work with legislators and agencies, such as through their uh, Iron Triangle, uh, through their lobbyists. They're going to be funding campaigns in, through the use of political action committees or PACs. They uh, are going to employ formal government, government officials through lobbying. And then when all of these things typically don't work, the last resort of interest groups tends to be uh, leading litigation. And that's very true, especially for the NAACP. Um, with ending segregation, they filed a Supreme Court, they filed a lawsuit, which is going to be Brown v. Board of Education, that makes its way to the Supreme Court. And of course, they're going to be successful there. So that tends to be the last means. And then other ways that they're going to influence is filing amicus curiae briefs, being a friend of the courts, where they're going to raise an additional viewpoint on a topic that matters to them. But again, here's a more of a pessimistic uh, viewpoint of interest groups, but they're not always like that. Uh, certainly, some are going to have more uh, ability and more access to work with your uh, politicians. But certainly, they're going to work with coalitions. They're going to be working within the Iron Triangle, uh, issue networks. They work with political parties. A good example, again, being the NRA, uh, definitely leaning more conservative, definitely leaning more towards the Republican Party. So they're going to be you know, working with them much more than, let's say, the Democratic Party. And then sometimes interest groups work together. Uh, so when it's fighting voter ID laws in which the ACLU and the NAACP are going to say are discriminatory towards uh, minorities specifically, they might join a similar lawsuit uh, together or fund the, uh, a certain political party um, through their PAC contributions. So again, just to remind you of iron triangles, which we covered in the bureaucracy unit. Again, it's sort of this ironclad idea that you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And that's why it's very difficult for an outside group or someone else to sort of impact policy. This chart right here basically is going to explain why tobacco still remains legal. I mean, these are basically ironclad. Uh, it's an ironclad triangle, which you cannot uh, break through. Now, issue networks sort of take a bigger, more modern approach, the idea that there's just more than three working groups, that there are multiple working groups in a specific, uh, dealing with a specific issue. Uh, so sometimes you see interest groups working with numerous other interest groups. Again, you don't have one necessarily dominating. And again, that leans heavily on Federalist Number 10, dealing with factions and the idea of pluralism, that not one particular interest group is dominating. Whether or not you believe that is true, Again, that's the, sort of uh, the whole idea behind that. Now, their influence is not going to be equal. There is undoubtedly an inequality of political and economic resources. You're not going to have equal access to the decision makers, such as the politicians. You also have issues with the free rider problem. You want people to join your interest group, but sometimes they don't. For example, if you're the Sierra Club and you're promoting clean air, well, if I didn't donate to the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club is, you know, lobbying and, and donating all this money and they finally get clean air uh, legislation passed. Well, everybody's benefiting from that. However, what about the people who did not pay? They are free riders, just like these gentlemen riding on the back of a truck. So one way that interest groups are going to try to encourage membership is by giving, uh, you know, selective um, benefits. For example, and this is a huge benefit, if you uh, are part of AARP for the old people, you get a 10% discount on a donut, I believe, from Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, so again, or you might get a free donut, I'm not sure, but you get something with a donut from Dunkin' Donuts. Certainly encouraging membership. Now again, their influence is going to be very much impacted by financial resources, how much money you can make, their donations. The more money you get typically is going to translate to more access to politicians, whether that be a phone call, in-person meeting, or just general support for the policy. But generally speaking, wealthier groups have more resources, thus more access, but that does not necessarily guarantee a win on policy, but it certainly helps. Big takeaway here, not all interest groups have an equal impact on policy. However, as some have more funds, 
they have greater access to decision makers, and again, they're going to probably have a little bit more committed members. And I really think of the NRA as being a really solid interest group. Uh, certainly, they have a lot of loyalty um, on that front. Uh, now, as I showed you here before, or I talked about the AARP with older people, not just to mention that, that donut that they get, but uh, with some of the benefits of membership, um, you get information. You can get apparently some type of insurance, representation, um, publications, travel discounts, and I guess if you want to network socially. So again, you have a wide range of benefits there. Now, how groups are going to try to shape policy is through lobbying, where you're basically going to be hiring somebody to communicate the interests on behalf of your group directly to a governmental decision maker. And there are two basic types. You have your regular paid ones who work for a corporation, a business, or a union. Then you have your temporary hires. Those are typically for smaller groups. But uh, so most people tend to have a very negative viewpoint of lobbying, as you see in this particular uh, graphic here. But uh, nevertheless, they do play a role in our uh, governmental system. As they are a source of information, they do help uh, plan political strategies for not only legislation, but also for re-election campaigns. So they will work with candidates. They also will provide new ideas and innovation. It is mixed as to whether they, they work or not, but again, a lot of that comes down to, I would imagine, the amount of wealth and resources that you have. And some have looked at politicians as sort of like a NASCAR driver, that they're more representative of corporations and interest groups as opposed to the everyday average person. Now, in terms of lobbyists, they're spending more than $2 billion uh, in Washington. Again, their, their task is to represent in the interests of organizations, and many of which are former members of Congress. And this is known as the revolving door, that once you leave Congress, you then work as a lobbyist for an interest group. Why? Well, you have those connections back in Washington, D.C. Sometimes they are going to issue scorecards score uh, for congressional members, such as the NRA. So politicians who are Democratic, who are not supportive of gun rights uh, legislation might get an F, whereas ones who are more conservative, who support it, are going to perhaps earn an A. So they provide information to their members. Also, they're going to engage in grassroots lobbying, where these are these computerized mailings, to encourage citizens to pressure representatives on an issue, and you probably have received those many uh, times. Now, there hasn't been too much legislation on what lobbyists um, are not allowed to do, but to an extent, uh, they have to report their uh, issues, seeking to influence in detail how much spending they have to disclose their clients, and they are not allowed to give gifts or payment for a meal. But again, the interest groups are allowed to be donating towards their campaigns, having some people believe that this is basically legalized bribery, but I'll leave that up to you. Interest groups, again, are going to be engaging in electioneering. Again, they're going to be very much involved in the election process, whether that's donating money in the form of a PAC, um, going out to uh, provide testimony on behalf of a candidate, or getting members to work for candidates. They certainly are going to do that. But again, very important when we talk about political action committees, that they, this is the political funding vehicle of an interest group, and it's going to allow them to funnel money to candidates legal legally speaking, and again, most money is going to be going towards inc incumbents. Why? They have such an overwhelming re-election advantage. I mean, just look at the money, and while this goes back several years ago, it shows you the, the wide gap between those uh, that money going to incumbents versus their challengers. Now, again, with litigation, as previously stated, that if an interest group is, fails in one arena, they will be looking to going to the courts. Um, and again, that tends to be their last way of trying to influence policy, especially through the class action lawsuits. But they will also raise additional viewpoints, as we said previously, through the amicus curie briefs. Um, and then lastly here, going public. Because public opinion does make its way to policymakers, we know that through public opinion polls, these interest groups are going to try to very much cultivate a good public image build a reservoir of goodwill with the public. They're going to use marketing strategies, just like political uh, campaigns are going to be doing that. They're going to advertise to motivate and inform the public. Um, and a good example, if you have time, is to watch this particular YouTube video, as it's about clean coal. And that is very controversial, if there's even anything about clean coal. But watching that is a great example of how interest groups try to go public and raise awareness of the issues that they want put forth 
into policy to better their interest group.